My name is Bob Norman, and on behalf of the York County Historical Committee, I would like to welcome everyone to this afternoon's presentation. Uh, this is a lecture uh, topic that was originally scheduled two years ago, but got derailed by COVID. So we're, fi we're, able, we're happy that we're finally able to present it. And we're very happy also to have the, our speaker, uh, Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander, uh, to give the presentation. Dr. Newby Alexander is a distinguished historian and author. Uh, she is professor of history and dean of the College of Liberal Arts at Norfolk State University. And she is director of the Joseph Jenkins Roberts Center for the African Diaspora, the diaspora, excuse me, I never can pronounce that, at Norfolk State University as well. In addition to her day jobs, as I just mentioned, she is a member of numerous boards and organizations, including the Yorktown Jamestown Foundation, the Virginia Law Foundation, the Historical Commission of the Supreme Court of Virginia, and, uh, and uh, several others. And she has appeared in a number of documentaries and episodes on C-SPAN. Dr. Newby Alexander's publications focus on Virginia's African-American history. And among her uh, books are Hampton Roads, Remembering Our Schools, Voices from Within the Veil and the Experience of Democracy, and her most recent book, Virginia Waterways and the Underground Railroad on which she uh, d presented uh, information from that book at a, at a uh, lecture a while back uh, here. So now that we know a little bit about her, it's time for me to turn it over to Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I would uh, like to thank the York County Historical Society and Bob Norman for reaching out to me and asking me to come and present once again to all of you. And this, of course, gives me an opportunity to come back to Yorktown and to really kind of see this community through um, different lenses. I am an active historian, and as such, uh, I'm always finding new things. When I wrote uh, the book on the waterways and the Underground Railroad in Virginia in 2017, actually it was published in 2017, um, and I actually had to cut a lot out of that book, um, there are a whole host of other new things I found out about the Underground Railroad and Hampton Roads in particular, Virginia in general, including more information about this tunnel that they uncovered at St. Mary's Basilica, which I found was directly connected with the Underground Railroad, and actually saw some of the people who escaped. So the stories are ongoing. So when people tell you history is dead, it's only because they are brain dead themselves. They don't know that every moment of every day there's something new that's being uncovered. And history is relevant. History connects the past to the present, and it informs our potential future. The first thing you do when you go to a doctor and you fill out all of those papers is they ask you one thing that's really important and can be annoying. What is your family's medical history? Because that medical history tells you not only what you could potentially be subject to in terms of conditions or diseases, but it also tells you what to avoid. If you have a family of diabetes uh, conditions, don't eat a lot of sugar and carbohydrates. You're more likely to get it, just as with history. We have a tendency in our society of being afraid of our past. We would prefer to do that la-la-la-la thing and not remember our past. But our past is written on our faces. It's a part of our DNA. Not only our, in our individual DNA, but it is a part of our societal DNA. 
And so even when we do like the three little monkeys, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, it's still there. The only thing we do is harm ourselves kicking that can down the road. And our young people who have a thing that people forget called a smartphone, so it doesn't matter what we try to ban. In fact, if we ban it, that encourages them to look it up even more. We miss the opportunity of educating them about that information and helping to direct them to the things that will give them an understanding, a larger understanding of what happened in the past and put it within context. And so today, I want to talk about the Civil War, and the Civil War in particular in Hampton Roads. You know, I call Hampton Roads America's for Forrest Gump, because here in Hampton Roads, it seems like everything that had some significance in American and world history happened right here in Hampton Roads, started right here in Hampton Roads. And so we ought to be embracing that information and that past. But what we have done is we have been afraid of that past. And as a result, it harms our overall society's understanding of who we are. There's this notion that everybody who's black supported the Union and everybody who's white supported the Confederacy. We know that was not true. Because people are individuals, and they have individual allegiances, connections, opportunities, etc. But generally speaking, the majority of African Americans, especially those who were enslaved, supported whoever would grant them their freedom. That was the most important thing. Because without freedom, it didn't matter. Without freedom, your master was still your master. And so that was key. And when we talk about then this time period, you know, for almost 100 years, we had a lie circulating in our country. And that lie said that the Civil War was about economics and it was about honor. And the reason I say it was a lie, not only because it was, but because it really obfuscates the real reason for the Civil War. It was about slavery. And slavery did involve economics. If you consider that America produced seven-eighths of the world's cotton production, seven-eighths, there was a lot of money being made. If you add up all of America's industries, it still was less than the industry of slavery in this country. Not a single president, including Abraham Lincoln, served more than one term if they were not a slaveholder during the period from George Washington to Abraham Lincoln. Slavery was important and legal throughout the country until states, following the American Revolution in the, in the North, began individually eliminating slavery within their boundaries. However, the US Constitution had a fugitive slave clause that said it didn't really matter. It didn't put it in these terms, but it didn't matter if a state eliminated slavery. That slaveholder or that bounty hunter could go anywhere in this country and retrieve a person that was considered to be a slave. And that person who was enslaved did not have the right to defend themselves. They had to have additional proof, including two whites, to verify that they were not enslaved. So the government made it difficult 
for even black people to defend themselves in a nation that had the idea that you had the right to defend yourself. But the nation made blacks chattel, a piece of property, like a cat, a dog, a cow, a sheep, a chicken. It removed the humanity from those individuals by law. And those are the things we need to understand. And that is why the Civil War is perhaps the most rancorous period in American history, because it represented a systemic transition and transformation of our society that in the 17th century began passing laws removing human rights from people of African descent as well as Native Americans. And not until 1866-67 did we see the eventual restoring of those rights. But then by the 1880s, we would see the Supreme Court begin to remove those rights once again by redefining the 14th Amendment to apply to corporations, not human beings. So the Supreme Court gave corporations civil rights, not a human being. A corporation can't vote. That's where civil rights come in. So we would see a very interesting transformation. So to understand the Civil War, you first have to understand that the primary issue was about slavery. But we don't always want to see that. But Frederick Douglass, interestingly, you know, he, there's a wonderful documentary that is out now on HBO, if you have HBO, where they um, have actors voicing his words. And one of the things that, that he said um, following South Carolina's decision to secede from the Union, and of course, when Lincoln, before he became president, you know, he always argued that because the Union was created by all of the states, and they gave power in that 1789 Constitution to the people, only the people can dissolve the Union. States cannot individually dissolve the Union. The people as a whole must dissolve the Union. And so he argued then that the states could not legally secede and would not recognize their secession. Now in doing so, that meant that not a single state that claimed to have seceded in Lincoln's mind did somehow was, was, was um, not uh, responsible for the law. So in other words, the Fugitive Slave Act still applied to the seceded states. So if someone ran away, the federal government had to return that person to their owner. And this went on from the time that South Carolina seceded until May of 1861. But was, I'm going to go back, I'm, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but I'm going to go back to what Frederick Douglass said. He said that black people should take advantage of what was going on. That in this chaos, take advantage and seize your freedom. And we would see a number of people attempt to do so, but most were returned, and in some cases, they were killed because they tried to escape. We would see something take place in August of 1861. Major General Benjamin Butler, who arrived, um, and actually he arrived in May of 1861, and he decided shortly after he arrived um, that he should, he should take control of that whole area. Fort Monroe 
created an impenetrable point at the mouth of what we call the Hampton Roads. You know, the Hampton Roads, how many of you know what the Hampton Roads are? One, two, three, uh, just a handful, about half of the people in here. The Hampton Roads, for those of you who don't know, is this body of water between Norfolk and Hampton in which all of the rivers pour into the Chesapeake Bay, creating what I call a hub, a superhighway hub by water. And so the Hampton Roads is this deep water access point where you can go hundreds of miles into the interior of Virginia and the native peoples use that as their transportation superhighway, which is why they built all of these wharves everywhere. And then when the English came in and waged war against them, they took over those wharves, renamed those areas into places like Hampton, Williamsburg, Jamestown, Norfolk, parts of what we call First Landing, which is Prince's Anne County. So they renamed them all these different areas. And they continued to utilize the waterways. So for those of you who are from this area, one of the things we suffer from is a lack of roads. Because the waterways used to be our roads. And they just started really building a lot of roads in the 1950s. Now, I'm not that old to remember all of that, which is why I'm a historian, but I do remember the last time the ferry went between Norfolk and Hampton. <laughs> I am that old to remember that. Now, if you can imagine, that's why travel around here is almost impossible at certain times of the day. And in the summer, it's completely intolerable because there are just not that many roads. And what did we do with the waterways? We l eliminated all the ferries. So you have to travel by road, not waterway. Well, around here, the waterways were key. And Fort Monroe was a critical point in the waterways. It was created following the War of 1812 because America determined it would never allow any foreign agents to come into the country with the idea that they would be able to enter in and actually burn our capital, which is what the British did. They made their way all the way into the Chesapeake Bay, up the James, uh, actually it wasn't the James, it wasn't the James River, but up the rivers, the York and so forth, all the way to the Potomac. Actually, it made its way th up through the Chesapeake Bay, it hit into the York, Potomac. It actually hit into all these areas because they also took a lot of people out of the area. They took thousands of enslaved people with them. And after that, we determined we would never allow any of that to happen again. Fort Monroe was constructed, ironically, using slave labor. And one of the primary engineers was Robert E. Lee, which is why he knew he could never attack Fort Monroe because he had helped to engineer an impenetrable fort. So no, I'm going to leave Fort Monroe al alone. And that's why Fort Monroe was was it was determined that it would not leave the hands of the Union Army. And it became, it moved from being a backwater area to a flashpoint area in 1861. And before it became such an important flashpoint area, Lincoln, because of patronage, political patronage, sent Benjamin Butler to be the commander of that fort. The day after he was there, Three men arrived by a little vessel, probably a skiff that looked like this, in the middle of the night. I understand that it was a full moon that night. But can you imagine going across 
the, the uh, Hampton Roads in a little vessel like this. And this drawing is actually of some men crossing the Hampton Roads in the middle of the night. These three men were actually escaped slaves, just like the three men who actually escaped. And this was actually done in the 1850s, about 1855. But it's a perfect image of what people confronted. Many people drowned trying to cross the Hampton Roads, and their bodies were never found, because the water is at least 300 feet deep. And so what happened? There were these three men, Shepard Mallory, James Townsend, and James Baker. They were all from Hampton. And these men were, had been conscripted to build fortifications for the Confederacy. And they heard that the troops were about to move further south. They did not want to leave their families. And so they decided to escape. And they did what a lot of people have been doing when any war happened in America. If you were enslaved, you always went to the other side. Because you figured they want your labor, your help, and they're willing to give you your freedom. And that's what these men did. And they arrived the next morning, and they were taken before Benjamin Butler in headquarters number one, which is still there. So if you if you are interested, visit Fort Monroe and go to that headquarters. And that room still exists that they went to that's depicted in this particular illustration. These three men gave an argument to Benjamin Butler that he was looking for. What did they say? They said, we are being forced to fight against you and we don't want to. They're using our labor against our will. We want to support the Union effort, not the Confederacy. And Benjamin Butler said, uh-huh. He was an attorney, by the way. He said, hmm, I can use that as my argument. So he quickly drafted a letter to President Lincoln indicating that he was going to declare these men contrabands of war because in returning them, he would be helping their enemies. And as a result, it would be like returning a gun to the person who's fighting against you. They were weapons. And he did not want to return weapons to the enemy. So he was using still the language of chattel in this argument about human beings seeking sanctuary, which is why they were called throughout the war contrabands instead of refugees. And in doing so, he opened a door that Lincoln and Congress would use later on that would enable them to continue not only to use their labor, but the labor of women and children as well. Women were, well, you know, a lot of times men think that they're the most dangerous creatures on the planet. I don't know why you guys think that, because women are far more dangerous in part because you don't expect us to be. But the other part is we're not trying to prove anything. If we're trying to, if you're in our way, and the only way to get through that door is to kill you, we're going to kill you. We're not going to fight you. We're going to kill you. And let's move it on. And we'll do it in a way that maybe you won't know about, such as poisoning, such as killing you in your sleep. Or we'll just take a shotgun. <laughs> This is what women did during the war. They also were spies, because no one expected women to be a threat. Men thought women were intellectually incapable of understanding politics and war. And we know, of course, that is not the case. But they believed that at that time, so women were very dangerous because they were underestimated. 
And so the military utilized this huge resource, over a million people. Now, I haven't even talked about the free blacks. Free blacks were very offended that they were also sort of thrown into that same bag of being a contraband because they were free. But because the law restricted their rights as human beings, there were black codes that would have a long list of, you know, slaves can't do this and this and this, but then they tacked on a lot of this, can't do this and this for free blacks as well. So after the Nat Turner revolt, free blacks couldn't go to school. They couldn't have black pastors. They had to have white people in their church at all time to oversee what they were doing. More than two couldn't gather together without a white person being present. They could not take a, a license or sit, you know, to be licensed to be a pilot, which is a navigator, or a ship's captain. So there were lots and lots of don'ts for free blacks. And, but free blacks were thrown into this category as well. So what did some free blacks do? Many of them worked as spies. Because mixing had occurred for many, many years. There were a lot of free blacks, as well as enslaved people, who could pass for white, and did so, period. But especially during the war, pretending to be Confederate soldiers and getting a lot of intel as a result, and bringing it back to the Union officials. Not only that, some of them actually enlisted in the Union Army without many people knowing that they were black. In addition to that, we had a lot of free blacks who called themselves free blacks, lived as free blacks, but were actually what I call freedom seekers. They lived in New Bedford. They lived in Boston. They lived in Philadelphia or the outskirts of Philadelphia. They lived in New York. And many of them also lived in Canada, in the Ontario province, Toronto especially, or they lived in Montreal, the maritime industry, Halifax, and Nova Scotia, of Nova Scotia other cities in Nova Scotia like Dartmouth. And so these individuals would quickly hear about what Benjamin Butler did in May of 1861 by declaring them contrabands. What he said was, I'm not going to return them. So what did he want to do with these people? He didn't know until he was forced to come up with what he should do. A few days after he made that decision, Hundreds of people arrived from Gloucester, Gloucester, and Yorktown. Now, I pondered why in the world, how did these people hear about it? Well, they probably didn't, not at that time. This was just a few days later. Probably what happened is that by May of 1861, with so much going on in the Confederate Army, there was less security and more opportunity. And many people began to quickly make their way to the Union Fort because at that time, after Butler arrived, more and more ships started coming in. And they were probably seeing those activities because where were these people living? They were living on plantations all located along the major rivers. And they could see the activity of the ships coming in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ships. And they made their way down. And this trickle became a flood, thousands, by the following month. And if you go to Fort Monroe, that opening still exists. You can drive a car, very carefully though, through that opening. But you can see that opening, and it looks the same. They don't. They no longer have a wooden bridge. It's all concrete now, and is in, is considered to be Freedman's Way or Emancipation Way, because this scene happened at that location. 
Well, with all these people arriving, Butler had to do something. So he began to put the men to work and the women to work. In fact, what he did initially, his decision said that men who were being used by the Confederacy to build fortifications or sharpshooters or any, any way, shape, or form by the Confederacy could receive sanctuary. But then after thousands were arriving with children, mothers, grandmothers, young women, as well as children began arriving, Butler said, I can't turn these people away. For humanitarian reasons, I'm going to extend this to them. But in extending it, he was also looking for something in return. And to assist them, he expected that these family groups that arrived, that the men would, in, would, would be engaged in government work. Now, of course, the problem was, you know, we had the quartermaster's office taking care of these people. And the quartermaster's office was always no, notorious for criminal activity. I think that's the nicest way I can put it. Um, food, clothing was sent to help these contrabands. And, of course, they sold the good food and gave them rancid food and made give them a few items. And word got out to the missionaries quickly about this, so that by September of 1861, missionary societies such as the American Missionary Society began to send people down to assess the situation, to help provide food, clothing, and education for these thousands of people coming down. But also, many of them had never had the opportunity to officially marry. So Lewis Lockwood, who became the superintendent with the American Missionary Society, and he was based at, in Hampton, he married hundreds of people. Interestingly, he also married interracial couples, many of whom already had families. They had two or three children already. And what that told me is that our relationships were far more complicated than the way the history books say they were. That complication is all about individuality. You may have a law, but as long as you didn't make a big deal of ignoring the law, they let you be at peace for the most part. I'll give you an example. In, this, in the 1840s, I ran, I ran across a law, it was a, a, a city ordinance, that directed the postmaster in Norfolk to stop delivering abolitionist newspapers to the enslaved population. Now I'm going to let that sink into your brain for just a second. First thing I thought, you mean the postmaster was actually delivering abolitionist newspapers <laughs> to slaves? They had subscriptions? They knew how to read? So what does that tell you about the reality of what went on and why so many whites were so terrified of the Underground Railroad and of enslaved people being able to write themselves passes because they knew some of them could read, especially if you lived in urban areas, especially if you lived in urban areas that had a cosmopolitan environment. And that was usually the case in a port city. That's how Frederick Douglass learned how to read while a child in Baltimore, cosmopolitan port city. And so the other thing about that is they had money because you can't have a subscription without money. And so what you saw was a lot of hiring out of your time because in urban areas, 
This is not a plantation scenario. In urban areas, you had small little lots, so you didn't have room except for maybe one or two servants to live on the spot. You had a lot of widows who depended upon enslaved labor for, for their pension, and so they hired them out. They hired them out to the Gosper Navy shipyard. They hired them out to, to the naval hospital. They hired them out to the sawmills. They hired them out to work the docks. They hired them out in all the hotels and taverns. They hired them out everywhere. And all they cared about is, are they going to pay me every week or every month? My pound of flesh, so to speak. And so you had a lot of mobility. And when you saw the rise of the Underground Railroad, that became a problem. It became a really big problem during the Civil War. And that also fueled a lot of anger and a lot of vitriol coming from the Confederates against blacks who were actually there, which actually then spurred them to leave as well. Many of them who came to the Union, though, didn't find a lot better situation for themselves initially because they weren't paid. They would take whatever their pay was and in exchange give them rancid food, tattered clothing. So they were very angry and upset about that. And word finally got to Lincoln and to Congress that these kinds of things were going on because the missionaries were coming down and ratting them out as well. And this happened not just in Hampton Roads, but it happened wherever there were Union troops um, uh, encamped. And that would eventually cause Congress to begin laying out some rules and regulations. I wanted you to see this particular drawing as well. I think it's really interesting. General Wool, John Wool, became commander of Fort Monroe because Lincoln figured after the contraband decision that Benjamin Butler was creating too many problems in Hampton and he wasn't ready for that. And so he took him out of that frying pan and put him right in the fire down in New Orleans. And that created its own set of issues and eventually brought Benjamin Butler back in 1864, where he created the Army of the James that included both black and white soldiers to help lay siege eventually to Richmond. And as a reward to the black soldiers who fought with him, he let them enter Richmond first. Just as, as a reward to the Soviets we let them, during World War II, <laughs> enter Berlin first. So, the, you know, it's not unusual that these things would happen. So we would see a lot of activity going on. And, of course, the more activity, the more word will get out. Word travels faster by word of mouth than even social media at least for our generation. The millennials is a different issue. It travels through social media because they talk through social media more than they do one another. And that's an interesting shift. But I wanted you to see this particular drawing. This is a very primitive looking drawing of a Newport News scene. Because I wanted you to see how desperate many of these refugees were. They, were, they grabbed whatever they could, and usually it was the clothes on their backs and their children. And these parents, grandparents, left just like that. And they already had tattered clothing. You know, there was no gone with the wind type clothing for enslaved people. That is just a complete fabrication. When you see the clothing of most enslaved people, you know how poorly they were treated. They got two sets of clothing per year, per year, a summer set and a winter set. 
Can you imagine wearing your same clothes every day, work, sleep, for half a year? What would those clothes look like? They're already um, that sort of broad cloth. You know, it's not a tight weave pattern. So all it would take is a month, and your clothes would start looking like rags. And you had to wear it for six months before you got another set. And so these people didn't have food, didn't have medicine, didn't have fresh water, not to mention wearing tattered clothing. And they were in the middle of a war. So their lives were at risk. And it was fortunate if they were able to find or were given a tent to use. Many of them, however, like in Hampton, they took the, the, the uh, pieces of wood after the Confederates burned down Hampton, and they, 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 they fixed up these makeshift houses for themselves these shacks to live in, to provide themselves with some kind of protection from the elements. And if you can imagine, we know today, in 2022, refugees have, are at a higher risk of death from diseases and so forth than anyone else. Can you imagine in 1861 what, what it was like when medical, modern medicine believed that you didn't drink water after a hard march. You drank spirits. So you already dehydrated, and you're going to drink alcohol to dehydrate you even more. That's what the modern medicine believed in. The Civil War advanced modern medicine out of its primitive stage into what, it, what we would consider to be a more modern stage, because most doctors had no idea how to amputate a leg without killing the patient. But they learned during the Civil War. How? Trial and error. If the person survived, that was a good treatment. If they didn't, uh-oh, can't do that anymore. And that's what helped to build modern medicine. Who do you think were the ones they experimented on the most? The same people they experimented on the most throughout slavery, enslaved people. And so even the makeshift hospitals that they had for people considered contrabands were horrible. They were death sites. And so it was extremely problematic for many of these individuals, and yet they still continued. And so these images tells you about the determination of families. They wanted to stay together. You know, the desire to keep your family unit together is what kept a lot of people from trying to escape from slavery. Because it was more difficult to escape with your family. And because your family often lived on, different, on a different plantation or at a different home. But you would see family groups. They would find each other and they would escape together if they could. And they grab whatever they could. And so if they were fortunate enough to have a wagon, it was probably because that wagon was owned by their, their master, and they simply took it. Now, I wanted you to see this particular map because I think it's, it's a really um, a good way to, to see where some of these engagements were. You see Fort Monroe at the bottom of the screen. I don't know if that, that can really show, but you can see Fort Monroe at the bottom, and of course going up the York River, um, and, and of course, you know, across land all the way to Richmond, or hitting into uh, the Potomac, excuse me, not the Potomac, but the Pamunkey River, and making your way to Richmond that way. Another way, of course, is right up the James River. 
Um, these were really important, and of course, the whole ironclad battle that happened in 1862 was because they were trying to go, they were trying to cut off the Confederate access point so that they would have free reign to get up to Richmond. Because what was the goal? The Union wanted to take Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy, and the Confederacy wanted to take Washington, D.C., the capital of the nation. And that's why that corridor, I-95, so many battles happened. In fact, 50% of the battles during the Civil War happened in Virginia. Virginia was devastated physically by the end of the war. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention about this particular battle, and I love this story, is something that was recently found out. Um, Mary Levest, uh, the real story of Mary Levest, her father was a refugee from Haiti. He arrived in Norfolk somewhere around 1794. Her mother was a free black from Norfolk. So she grew up in the Catholic Church, St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Norfolk, which is now St. Mary's Basilica, the largest predominantly African-American Catholic basilica in the country. And she married a man, her name was Olga V. She married a man named Leves, who was from Guadalupe. He worked in the engineer's department at the Gosport Navy shipyard. He and a white man, who also worked in the engineer's department, who was anti-Confederacy, copied the plans of this new ironclad ship, formerly the USS Merrimack, renamed the CSS Virginia. For whatever reason, they gave them to Mary to get to Washington, D.C. and give it in the hands of Gideon Wells. I don't know how. I suspect she went by ship because it would have been an impossible journey by land. Somehow she made it to Washington, D.C., and interestingly, she actually refused to give it to anybody other than Gideon Wells and actually gave it to him. So she had to have been a formidable woman to get up to Washington, D.C., and to see one of the secretaries insisting she had intel that he needed to see. He did see it. He thanked her. He said this was actually proof positive for them, what the Confederates were doing, and they sped up the creation of the USS Monitor. And that particular battle happened in part because of Mary Levest and what she did. And she stayed in communication with Gideon Wells. We have some of her letters and his letters between the two of them. That ironclad battle was important for a multitude of reasons because it was part of the first peninsula campaign, that first effort by the Union government to take Richmond, which they squandered in part because McClellan, who was the commander of the Union forces, always overestimated the power of the Confederate forces and never would move forward when he should have always pulled back, always un overestimated their strength and underestimated his own army's strength. There are some historians who believe that he really was probably sympathetic to the Confederacy and, and therefore was a little, that may have played a role in his decision making. We will never know, that's just speculation. But we do know that President Lincoln got so frustrated with him that he eventually reassigned him to having no army to control, and that's how he got him out. And, of course, McClellan ran against him for president. So when people talk about the rancorous politics of today, it's like, okay, we don't have anybody trying to beat somebody half to death on the, in the, on the floor of Congress as we did <laughs> in the late 1850s. And we didn't have swords drawn and all that, not yet, and hopefully we won't see some of that. But that's a rancorous political scene. 
Um, but Lincoln understood that he had to not only expand the holdings of all of the territories in Hampton Roads, but he had to also utilize African Americans to help. And so by May of 1862, the Union took over Norfolk. It began to move up the peninsula, it began to take over places such as Warwick County, Newport News, Yorktown, and so forth. And in taking over, they left, of course, uh, troops to not only hold the area, but also to recruit. And they weren't recruiting whites, they were recruiting blacks to be a part of the military. This is just a picture of the Union forces marching into Norfolk and taking over that city. And Yorktown in May of 1862, following this period of the First Peninsula Campaign, this is a, a picture of uh, the scene right there on the York River where they had secured that area. Of course, they had a lot of problems because the Confederates left a lot of bombs everywhere, killing some of the soldiers. But they used that as a place of recruitment. And they ended up, interestingly, with more refugees coming to Yorktown than there were soldiers. I'll repeat that. There were more refugees eventually coming to Yorktown than there were soldiers. So this area was filled with blacks who were not only seeking sanctuary, but many of the men wanting to fight. But the Union government had not yet allowed them to begin to enlist, but that would be coming. What will we see taking place? Well, here's a, an interesting picture, and I, I'm, I'm going to juxtapose two pictures. So these are some of the people, the refugees, those considered the contrabands, who were at Allen's farmhouse, which is on Williamsburg Road in the general Yorktown area. And this is a longer view, so you can see the tents of the Union forces, and on the horizon, the York River. It's kind of difficult to see. You have to really zoom in on the picture. And, and so you're, you're seeing the landscape of what it looked like and how this was a place for so many African Americans, the first step place of freedom. And they were going to stay free. So there was a determination that was in the air. Now we would see freedom seekers everywhere, but where were they going to stay? So the army needed to, to funnel out more and more tents to help them. And then in the absence of tents, there would be these cobbled together areas. So you would see a slab town in Yorktown, just as you would see a slab town in Hampton, they called it Slab Town because they were taking wood from destroyed houses and so forth and cobbling them together. But they were creating communities for themselves. And these communities would form the first post-emancipation black communities in the country with black people owning land in those communities. Interestingly though, I should say horribly, some of these people purchased the land from the federal government that had seized the land from these Confederates. Andrew Johnson, when he came in office, after he pardoned these ex-Confederates, he gave the land back to the whites and did not compensate the blacks for the money they paid for the land. And so then some of the families would go back and maybe years later buy the land once again. Here's a picture of the slab town in Hampton. What we call Phoebus today, that was slab town. The grand contraband camp was downtown Hampton. 
And that site became Hampton's Black Business District. That's where one of the first black banks in Virginia opened up for the shipyard workers at the Newport News, the Huntington Shipyard. Eventually, the owner of that bank, Brown, moved to Norfolk, and everything that he did in the banking industry, the, the white banks imitated because he was helping blacks to become homeowners. How do you become homeowners? You know, it's like, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? How do you become a homeowner? Contribute a little bit of money every week. And over a few, after a few years, you have enough money to purchase your home. And so Hampton really became a model for a lot of places throughout this region of how African Americans who have the skills, who have the will, can help produce, and produce um, tremendous uh, economic institutions for themselves. But then, of course, there's another institution that came along with that that the missionaries helped to create, and that was educational institutions. In fact, regardless of where they were in Hampton Roads, African Americans clamored for education. And there were schools, day schools for the, for the, um, uh, for the children, and night schools for the parents. There's one story of a mother and daughter who were um, encamped at Craney Island. That was one of the contraband camps. And the mother would take the one dress that they shared between them and go out in the evening to go to night school. And the daughter would take that one dress in the morning and go to school in the morning. And then in the afternoon, the mother would wear the dress so she could do some work to help keep the family afloat. One dress shared between a mother and a daughter. That's how desperate they were to get an education and for their children to get an education. And because of that, we would see the children born in and around the Civil War become, who were part of freedom's first generation grow significantly as professionals. We would see a, 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 a flood of blacks becoming attorneys, physicians, nurses, teachers, entrepreneurs, a bustling business district would occur. What helped to calm, to not calm that, but what helped to contract that, s slow that progress down? Laws. There were laws that started to get put in place that would restrict where black businesses could exist. Laws put in place to restrict how, what, what kind of hospitals, black hospitals you had, what kind of, of black um, training schools for, for teachers, for nurses, for physicians, opportunities for black people to go to graduate school, professional school, limited, restricted by race. Hospitals, medical schools had to shut down because the American Medical Association became a powerful lobby group, restricting membership to white men only. So they hurt white women, too, who were trying to be physicians. And set that bar so high financially that most hospitals couldn't reach it unless they were funded in some way by these white doctors. They continued that progress, by the way, with the large health care uh, companies that we have today. And they were the ones who kind of helped to open the door to these huge healthcare corporations taking over and making your health and my health a matter of dollars. But a lot of that got started in the latter part of the 19th and early 20th centuries. We would see by the end of the war, these freedmen villages create more sustainable, substantial houses 
barrack-like buildings, as well as really nice homes, businesses made of brick, not just of wood. And we would see this within 10 years. In fact, the Freedmen's Bureau helped to promote a lot of this growth and development by giving jobs to black men who were skilled at brick masonry and carpentry and so forth. Sarah Garland Jones, who was the first African-American woman licensed to practice medicine in Virginia in 1893. Her, her father, George Boyd, was the largest, the largest black contractor in Richmond who built just about every funeral home, every major business that was black owned in Richmond, including Maggie Walker's bank. So you would see this growth and this burst of development happen right after the Civil War. I, I wanted to sort of give you this, this quick little um, timeline as I check my time to make sure I don't get too much past my time, which I think I already have. But I wanted to point you to the August 1861 and May of 1862 um, acts. Because those two acts, and often is called the First and Second uh, Confiscation Act, these acts provided for blacks not only to be um, accepted as contrabands and provided food and clothing and, and jobs and so forth, but eventually to become in what they call contraband armies. Their job was to forage for food, and to help recruit other blacks who were on different plantations or in different locations to come behind Union lines. And many of those men who served in the contraband armies, who also, by the way, transported some of the most dangerous stuff for the Union Army, and that was their weapons, these men would be some of the first to enlist in the military. But it wouldn't be until Abraham Lincoln decided to issue the Emancipation Proclamation in January of 1863, that we would really see a, a shift. In that emancipation, he did two things. He said, slavery is over. Now, of course, he didn't have the power to change the Constitution. He said, as commander in chief during this war, slavery is over. And who is it over for? That, that was the caveat. So he said it's over for all the areas under rebellion. So in other words, Confederacy, you want to act like you're a separate nation? Good. Those people who are in your territory who are enslaved, they're free. And I'll give them sanctuary. In fact, I'll do you one better. I'll recruit them as soldiers, give them weapons, and they'll fight against you. Now, he did all of that in the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation with a threat. He said, South, if you don't surrender, I'll set that wolf loose on you. The thing that you fear the most that Thomas Jefferson talked about, the thing that Lord John Dunmore threatened to do with the Ethiopian regiment during the American Revolution, I'm going to do that to you. If you lay down your arms, I won't issue this. But if you don't, I will. And of course, he heard nothing. After he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, De Jefferson Davis issued his own proclamation, ordering all the Confederate troops to kill any black people in Union uniform, and to kill all of the white soldiers leading them as well. And so it resulted in the massacre that happened at the Battle of the Crater in Petersburg. It resulted in a lot of horrible things, including a refusal by Lincoln to exchange prisoners with the Confederacy. Because instead of exchanging prisoners, 
The Confederacy, if they captured a black man in uniform, they'd either kill him or sell him as a slave. And Lincoln said, for every person you do that to, we'll do the same thing to one of your prisoners. So I suggest you not do it. So there was a lot of stuff going on during the war that a lot of people don't know about. And a number of soldiers were recruited. And, and one of the things I wanted to show you, and, and there was a handout that hopefully you got. It's just a, a beginning point for you. This one that has the United States Colored Troop Regiments. There were a total of 138 infantry regiments that were part of the United States Colored Troops. There were six cavalry units, 15 artillery regiments. And these men, and these are, these are all found at the Library of Congress website, and of course, all taken by a professional photographer, uh, in these pictures. But these are the men who endured the, the problem of pay. And the 54th Massachusetts Regiment took the extraordinary um, step in refusing unequal pay for over a year, demanding that they be paid the same as the white uh, soldiers, because they said they'd rather not be paid at all than to take less of a pay because that meant that their lives were worth less. And so the 54th changed a lot of that. Most people don't know that the majority of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment was made up of freedom seekers or children of freedom seekers. These were people who had escaped through the Underground Railroad or their parents had escaped. And they were the motivated group. They had a dog in that fight. And that's why they were so determined and their actions were so monumental, including the assault on Fort Wagner that resulted in one of the soldiers, William Carney, who was born in Norfolk, to be receive the Medal of Honor. There were 26 African American men who received the Medal of Honor during the Civil War. The medal was started after the Battle of Gettysburg as a way that Lincoln wanted to honor people who had fought and in some cases perished for the kind of extraordinary work they did in battle. I wanted to also say that we have to remember the Navy too. And there were a number of sailors who were black who fought during the Civil War. Now, we have to, and I'm going to say this sarcastically, thank uh, President Woodrow Wilson for segregating the Navy in such a harsh and demeaning way because it wasn't segregated before. Now, yes, there was discrimination in the Navy, but not to the point of restricting black men to be either messmen or corpsmen, servants, essentially, in the Navy. But during this time, there were men like Sia Carter who got aboard the ships, one of their ships, and became what they call initially a boy and then eventually a sailor aboard the ship. And he was someone who escaped during the Civil War, early part of the Civil War, and continued to fight and even survived the sinking of the Monitor. We would see black troops fighting at Bermuda 100 and many other battles, important battles. And I wanted to point out this one. Now, this is just a small selection. I did not, I, I stopped at the G's. A tiny selection that you can find on this website of people, men who enlisted in the 4th. And I love the history of this particular regiment because they were everywhere. They were in all these different battles. Some of the men received the Medal of Honor who were part of the 4th. 
And these men endured tremendous discrimination. And yet they continued to fight because they weren't fighting just for the United States. They were fighting for their families and the future of African Americans. And they wanted to make a point. And that point was that this war and their freedom was not given to them. It was paid in blood. And so for us to erase that history is a crime. Because when someone pays in blood for their freedom, that is something that should never be taken away. And so there are many, many images of black soldiers that you don't see. You don't see a lot of photographs, but you do see some drawings. This drawing was in the book, The Black Phalanx, by Joseph T. Wilson, who escaped from Norfolk through the Underground Railroad in 1854, I believe. Got to New Bedford, joined a whaling vessel, was down there in Venezuela when he heard about the outbreak of the war in 1861, made his way on a packet ship back up to the United States and eventually joined the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. He was wounded in battle, returned to Norfolk in 1864, and got a job, a really nice job, as a gauger, you know, the person in charge of weights for, for the, the uh, maritime industry. So that was like a f nice, cushy federal job. He continued working in that role and eventually became a colonel in the Grand Army of the Republic. This was before the Grand Army got racist, tremendously racist and banned black mem blacks as members. He was so revered by his fellow uh, Grand Army of the Republic members that when he died at the turn of the 20th century, he, he died in Norfolk. They draped the steamship, the Luray, in black crepe, placed his body on the ship, and carried it to Hampton, which is, you know, one of the, um, on Hampton University's campus, which is one of the, where one of the huge Civil War um, uh, cemeteries is located. And they buried him there and thousands of Grand Army of the Republic troops greeted his body and buried him there. And it was reported in all the newspapers in Virginia what happened. He also was a writer publishing several newspapers and was commissioned by the Grand Army of the Republic to actually write about the black soldiers. So he interviewed the black soldiers about what happened. And so a lot of information that we know came from his book, The Black Phalanx, as well as these images. But I also wanted to mention this woman, Harriet Tubman. You know, the only thing I can say is that anyone who crossed that woman probably did not live to tell any tales. Um, little woman, fierce, emboldened, confident. She served as a soldier. She led troops into battle. And just like Mary Levesque, because they were women, the army would not, could not legally recognize them as soldiers. They only recognized men as soldiers. And so she couldn't get a pension. She worked as a nurse. In fact, she was head of the contraband hospital at Fort Monroe for a short period of time. But it paid too little money, and she needed to support her family. She, was, she worked as a spy. And the thing that most people don't realize is, you know, there was no big poster with her picture on it. You know, during the time of slavery or even the Civil War, nobody knew what she looked like except for the person who owned her at one point and her former husband and her family. 
and a few of the other people, such as William Still, who operated the Underground Railroad in Philadelphia, but most people didn't know what she looked like. And she always had these wonderful disguises. So she was able to work as a spy and blend in. And she was responsible for helping in an operation that resulted in the escape of thousands of people down in South Carolina. So, you know, the, this, this image, once again, of black soldiers, this was published in Harper's Weekly. It tells you, it, 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 it doesn't tell you about everything that's going on, but you can see in this picture black men and white men riding together. That in and of itself says there's a lot that we don't know about what's going on that has been left out of the history, but we do know it wasn't a separate type of engagement that these men were fighting, in some cases, side by side. And the black troops were trained. In fact, we would see the, the first uh, colored cavalry formed at Camp Hamilton, which is where the Veterans Hospital in Hampton is located. Uh, we would see the second one formed at Fort Monroe. We would see a total of six regiments formed in Hampton Roads. The 4th Regiment, and this on this um, uh, paper, this tells you about some of their engagements, how they were originally formed in Baltimore, and how they were moved to Fort Monroe, where they would get thousands of other men, and eventually based in Yorktown, right here. We would also see them engaged in some of the major campaigns in Virginia. And of course, three of the men, Christian Fleetwood, Alfred Hilton, and Charles Veal, they would all receive the Medal of Honor who were part of the fourth. This picture also, another person who was from this region, um, they, were, they, were, they also received the Medal of Honor. Now the reason they, they not only did some incredible fighting, but these men should have been promoted to officer status, but the Army refused. They were not going to have a black man be an officer unless he was a non-commissioned officer like a surgeon. Instead, they would rather give him a Medal of Honor than promote them to an officer level. And this is the picture of Joseph T. Wilson, the only one, actually, that we have, where he's in his regalia as part of the Grand Army of the Republic. And he's the one who published a lot of information about the Fort Pillow Massacre, the one that was led by Nathan Bedford Forrest, who was also the founder of the Ku Klux Klan in Tennessee, who had most of the soldiers who surrendered killed bayoneted as they laid down on the ground, wounded or shot in firing squad fashion. That is what really angered Abraham Lincoln when word got out about that. And there were repercussions for the Confederacy. And so, you know, I wanted to just mention, you know, I didn't mention at all what happened in the Dismal Swamp, which was covered a lot of land in Hampton Roads. In fact, if you visit the swamp today, it's only one-eighth, maybe, the size that it originally was. And you had the Union recruiting men to serve in the military from the swamp because there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of what we call maroons living in the swamp. And many of those individuals, their descendants, are still living what used to be part of the Dismal Swamp. Today we call it Suffolk <laughs> and Chesapeake. <laughs> that was horrible, I know. <laughs> you know, and, and I, wanted, I wanted to just also say that, you know, there were a lot of tensions that emerged after the war, as you can imagine. This was a horrific, violent period. There were lots of people who were lynched, lots of violence that went on. Um, and, and a lot of anger and resentment, especially from the returning Confederates. Many of the blacks were not interested in revenge, and there were lots of articles published about that. They just wanted to be left alone. 
They wanted to be able to live their lives as free people, un undisturbed by violence and so forth. But they would push to create institutions of higher education, such as Hampton Institute, which would become Hampton University, schools throughout the area. We would see Norfolk Mission College in Norfolk emerge. We would see, of course, Howard University, the only HBCU funded by the federal government. We would see the birth of so many um, uh, institutions of higher education for African Americans right after the Civil War and, of course, all throughout the end of the 19th into the 20th century. And these were responsible for helping to produce thousands, thousands of entrepreneurs, of skilled artisans who would open up their businesses, of professionals, uh, doctors and lawyers and teachers and so forth, nurses. But we would see African Americans honor their dead. In Norfolk, you would have West Point Cemetery that was founded by a former United States Colored Troops veteran, James Fuller, who was a city councilman. Uh, and he made sure that there was a site to honor the dead who served in the military. And he's buried there. And they also wanted to honor one of their own, William Carney, who, whose image is at the top of this monument. And in Portsmouth, and you know, the city of Portsmouth refused, refused to ever create a black cemetery for its citizens. And it wasn't until the, the late 1960s when they desegregated the cemeteries that blacks could bury their dead in a public cemetery. So there were a lot of private cemeteries, such as Lincoln Memorial Cemetery. And that monument is dedicated to the black Civil War veterans from Portsmouth. And, on, and the name of Charles Veal is on that monument because he was a Portsmouth native. I wanted to end with pointing out this particular song. It was a favorite song by the Union, the Black Union uh, soldiers. And I thought it was so apt. And I wanted to kind of focus on the chorus <clears throat> where it says, Oh, give us a flag all free without a slave. We'll fight to defend it as our fathers did so brave. The gallant Company A will make the rebels dance and we'll stand by the Union if we only had a chance. And then it concludes with, so rally, boys, rally. Let us never mind the past. We had a hard road to travel, but our day is coming fast. For God is for the right, and we have no need to fear. The Union must be saved by the colored volunteers. Thank you. We have time for a, a few questions. I only ask that if you have a question, if you raise your hand, and I'll bring you the mic. I mean, maybe everybody in the room can hear you, but we need the audio for the uh, videotape. I'll be right back here, so if you have a question, let us know. I'm back here. I just want to know if you're selling your books here or downstairs. Um, they'll be downstairs in the lobby. Yes, anyone who wants to buy one of my books can go downstairs to get them. Thank you. Just a note. Well, this I don't here, think it's on. Push it on the bottom. Yeah, let me hit it again. It's on the very top. I don't know what the problem is here. Well, just, just a note. The more things change, the more things remain the same. You were talking about the abolition of the newspapers that wouldn't be delivered. Facebook. <laughs> tweet, tweet, tweet. <laughs> All of them the same thing. Who have deplatformed anybody that they don't like. That, that is true. We have a lot of um, censorship yeah. going on. 
And, and the, the, the problem in a free democratic society is where do you draw the line? Uh, you know, do you, do you ban books? Do you ban free speech? And, and how do you make sure that you stay in a civil society while at the same time allowing that freedom of speech? And I'm, I'm in agreement. I don't think that freedom of speech should be banned unless it goes along with what the Supreme Court said years ago, which is if you scream fire in the middle of a crowded theater and people are harmed, you, that eliminates your freedom of speech because it, it goes as far as hurting, you know, actually putting other people in, in physical harm. But generally speaking, I agree that, that you know, the platform to speak is essential to a democracy. And then you can start your own if anybody comes and gives you business. Other, other questions? Here's one. Uh, you mentioned the word boy and sailor. Was boy a rank? Yes. It, it was, when you were listed as a boy, it was usually an underaged person, someone who was actually a child. Um, and you did not, it, it, was, it was like um, um, the, lowest, the lowest level, often you were paid in food, not in actual money. Uh, you were not recognized as being able to have a pension. Uh, you were the gopher on the ship, so you would, you know, do all of the kinds of activities that nobody else wanted to do. Um, and so it was usually a, a, a rank that a child would hold, a bo a, actual, an actual boy. And so when a black man was listed as a boy, that was the lowest level that they would, you know, put a black man in. And that was before the first and second confiscation acts were passed. Uh, it, was, it was during that period before the federal government actually recognized black men and their ability to serve in the military. Once that was done, many of them actually got the rank of sailor. But, you know, Sia Carter became part of the, of the, the um, uh, what is it? He became one of the sailors listed as a boy aboard the USS Mo Monitor. And that was right before the time of the second Confiscation Act that would have allowed him to actually have a higher rank. Uh, yes. White men could be considered boy, rank, they could be. If they were a boy, if they were actually a boy, if they were by age a boy, they would be considered that. But a man, a person who was 18, 17 years old, would not be considered a boy. We're talking if about you being, were being in the military service, white or black, you could be a boy. In service, it'd be a rank as a sail, if you were working aboard a ship. So in the, in the army, it was a different type of thing. So a lot of young boys were buglers, or you know, they, they, hmm? they were drummers, yes. And so they kind of occupied that same lower level rank where they were not adults yet. And they, but they were just as in danger of being killed as a soldier, um, but they were, um, they were underage. But what the, the Navy would do is they would make these adult black men boys. They would list them as boys, doing, doing the you know, base level kinds of work because they didn't see them as men. And like I said, it wouldn't be until later on in 1862, 1863, that that would change. Once Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation authorizing that the military enlist blacks, that's when it would change. I think we've got question, uh, one more uh, question, and here she is. Yes. Um, 
Well, I'd never heard of the Grand Republic Army. What Grand was that? Grand Army of the Republic. Yes, thank you. Yes, the Grand Army of the Republic was made up of the uh, soldiers who fought during the Civil War. And initially it was the Union Army. Uh, and then by the time they excluded blacks from membership, it, was, it also included people who were um, not so much the Confederate Army, although there were some Confederate members, who, um, men who became members of the Grand Army of the Republic. Mostly it was uh, those who fought in the Union. I think that's about all the time we have. I'd like to thank Dr. Newby Alexander for an entertaining and very informative <laughs> presentation. Thank you. Thank you.